All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And uh, welcome to uh, Bible study number six. We want to welcome those who are maybe watching us online. We are in a different venue this morning. Uh, we are in the narthex of the sanctuary building because the parish hall is being used by Lifeline, and they are testing, doing tests on folks, so medical, medical, medical tests. So, yeah, maybe some mental tests too, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, so here we are. We hope you can see it's a little loud in here, and, uh, but anyway, let us begin with the hymn. We're not going to read it all. Uh, ladies, would you please read uh, verse 1 of the hymn, Lord of Glory. Lord of glory, you have bought us with your life blood as the price, never grudging for the lost ones that tremendous sacrifice, and with that have freely given blessings countless as the sand to the unthankful and the evil with your own unsparing hand. Let me read verse 3. Lord of glory, you have bought us with your lifeblood as the price, never grudging for the lost ones that tremendous sacrifice. Give us faith to trust you boldly, hope to stay our souls on you. But, oh, best of all your graces, with your love, our love renew. Okay, Miss Marlene, be the leader, please. Lord Jesus, you looked at the adulterous woman and at those surrounding her with their accusations, and you said, If, if any one of you is without sin, sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. We confess that we, like the adulterous woman, as well as those surrounding her, have sinned. But we know also that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. And purify us from all unrighteousness. We confess that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. We are sorry, and we ask for your forgiveness in and through your perfect life, your death, and resurrection for us. We specifically recall the following sin. Let's just take a moment for a private confession. Everyone, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Go now and leave your life of sin. Be assured your sins are forgiven you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. If you look down on the, in the next paragraphs, they talk about javelin prayers. I've never heard a javelin prayer. You have? I guess, I guess it's, I've never heard of it. Anyway, there's some suggestions at the bottom. You can, uh, you can look at that. All right. I prefer, I prefer the non-formal uh, prayers when you're talking to God on a personal level. Anybody ever do that? Huh? Do you do that? Yeah, good. And I, I think that's, uh, that's more of a prayer life than the formal prayers we offer is, you know, having that conversation. And it's always amazing how things come to your mind. And not always the good things either, are they? All right, so we're in John chapter one, one, 7. Now, before we go through all of this, let me say this is one of the most confusing sections in John's Gospel for me. I, hopefully you've read it ahead of time. Uh, the best I can say, it is a series of short dialogues with questioning and challenging and objecting, and it goes back and forth, okay? And I, I don't... I don't understand. I don't know if I've preached on this section much at all. Uh, but you'll notice that this, the festival here is the Feast of what again? Tabernacles. Tabernacles, yes. You should have a note somewhere maybe. 
The Feast of Tabernacles was a celebration of the the for the 40 years, yes, harvest, but the end of the, the 40 years in the wilderness when God provided manna and water from the rock. Remember that? And so, and they lived in tents. They wandered. So what did the Jews do for seven days? It comes in September, October. What did they do for seven days in the fall? Where? No, they went to Jerusalem and they put, put their own little shacky tents up and they lived in little tents. There are pic- I have pictures of that. They were like canvas tents, kind of like our tents today. And, that was, and they lived in that for seven days, okay? And there were things that went on all the time. The sprinkling of water or pouring of water was part of it out of the Pool of Siloam and probably some other things. But it was uh, one of the three great festivals, and this was in September and October, to remember that the Lord was with them during their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Right? Remember those years, Daryl? No? Yeah, quite well. Okay. So let me begin, all right? Jesus goes to the feast. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea, because the Jews there were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near, notice this Newsom. Jesus' brother said, You ought to leave here and go to Judea, so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Let's just stop there for a moment. What were they thinking Jesus to be? No, some great, some great uh, doer, some great public, public, yeah, some great performer, yeah, miracle performer, yeah, that's a good title. And they, and they didn't believe in him as the Savior of the world, the Messiah. They only believed in him as someone who could do great miracle signs. So why don't you go to Jerusalem? Can you hear him? Why don't you go to Jerusalem and do some miracles? So everybody can and make some money, maybe. I don't know. Everybody will think how great you are. You never, you don't do this in secret. You do it in public. Shows how what? Absolute good word, man. You ought to be Thank teaching you. today. But yeah, they are shallow. They have a very non-divine view of who Jesus is. All right. And remember, they've grown up with him. They've been they're, they're in their thirties now, and they still don't even get it. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, okay, so late 20s, let's say late 20s. They didn't believe him. Yeah, okay, all right. Verse 6, therefore Jesus told them, the right time for me has not yet come. By the way, we hear the right time a number of times <laughs> in our cha- in this chapter. The right time for me, for, your, for you, any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that what it does is Evil. Now let's just, I preached on that Sunday. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Remember that? All right. Nobody wants to hear about sin. It's still true to this day. By the way, after church, someone said to me, Pastor, what used to be sin is no longer called sin. And that's true. I think that's probably very specific. Many things that were considered sinful are now no longer considered. It's okay, yes, it's all right. Yeah, interesting. See, and nobody wants to deal with sin, and especially in our culture, and that's very prevalent because when you have to admit your own sin, oh, then there's something wrong with me. And we're living in a time where you're okay, I'm okay. You may make a few mistakes, but no, you don't sin. No. Yeah, very, very different worldview, which when it ends, how do you deal with that? I mean, when you could, I know how to live with sin because I recognize it. So there's, yeah, well, you confess it, you seek to what? And change and improve, right? 
But if you don't, if it's not sin, and, you know, so I steal, I guess it's okay to keep on stealing. No? No, that's the world's way. I mean, that would, that would make sense to me. All right? Yeah. All right, let's move on. So Jesus gets in trouble because of sin. Where are we? You go to the feast. I'm not go yet going up to the feast because for me the right time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers left for the feast, he went too. Not publicly, but secretly. By the way, Jesus did this quite often in crowds. Remember that? There was and a woman, there was a woman who picked him out of a crowd. Remember that? I think I preached on that one time. And uh, he, was, he was not hiding, but he was secretly. Um, okay, we have, um, whatchamacallits are coming? Amy and, Amy and uh, Steve. So you want to yell at them? One of you go out and get them. Tell them they can sit in the back. All right, I'm going on. Uh, now the feast of the Jews, the Jews were watching for Jesus, asking, where is that man? Now notice this. Notice verse 12. Among the crowds there was widespread whispering. Some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's not. He deceives the people because he was telling them things they couldn't understand. All right. But no one would say anything publicly for fear of the Jews. Now let us understand that. You have to understand in, in Jesus' ministry, especially the beginning of his ministry, if, you, if the public was talking about Jesus, they could get themselves in trouble. Everybody understand that? You know, no matter what they said, they got in trouble because they didn't want him talking about it. Right? Because Jesus was a... Jesus was a threat. Threat to them. Absolutely. All right. Now, moving on. Verse 20. You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Is that where I am? Oh, I skipped. I'm sorry. Where am I? Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed. How did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. And there's a lot of that in this section. Anyone who chooses to do God's will he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself. Yes, uh, it's still true. But he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There's nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Let not, yet not one of you keeps the law. <laughs> Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you were all astonished. Yet, because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but the patriarchs, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. If a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. What's that a reaction? What's that a reference to? When he healed the man on the Sabbath day. Remember that? The crippled man. And he told him to get up. And the guy was carrying his mat out of the temple area. And the Pharisees saw it and they yelled at him. What you, why you, that was against the law. And then Jesus got in trouble because he healed someone on the Shabbat day. You're not supposed to do that. All right. Where are we now? What verse? Thank you. All right, let me see here. Anything else? I uh, notice the hour has not yet come. That becomes increasingly important. All right, where are we? Verse what? Oh, yeah, okay. The healing of the cripple at Bethsaida Pool. Remember that? That was a couple weeks ago. All right. Is Jesus the Christ? That's this section, 25 to 44. <laughs> At that point, some of the people began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is. The, notice the people of Jerusalem. 
okay? That's important. Not all the folks from Judea and, and all the other areas and Galilee, the folks of Jerusalem. This was the, hoi, this was the uh, hoity-toities, the governmental religious folks. Isn't this, the, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly. They're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities concluded that he is the Christ? Oh, wow. But we know where this man is from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from because he will what? Descend from heaven. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me. You know where I'm from. I'm not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Notice the number of times it says sent. And who is he? The Father. Let's use the term Father. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time, here it is again, his time had not yet come. We don't appreciate those so much. That evidently God did not allow the Father, let me say this, and Jesus, did not allow the intentions of the people to be fulfilled until the right time came. And when was the right time? Passover. Passover on that Friday, yes. Very significant that Jesus died on that day, okay? And we're not sure what year of his ministry this is, at least I'm not. All right, where are we? Still many in the crowd put their faith in him. They said, when the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. All right? So remember that phrase. The guards are sent to arrest him. We're going to come back to that at the end of our session. Everybody with me? Verse 33. Jesus said, I am with you for a short time only, and then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me. You won't find me. For where I am, you can't come. But you said to one another, where does man, man intend to go that we can't find him? Will he go where our people live, scattered among the Greeks and teach, and teach the Greeks? There were a lot of Jews that had spread throughout the Roman world, right? Everybody understand that? By the way, and, and just a few years later, St. Paul's ministry was to the Jews, was to the Jew Greeks, uh, the Jewish, the Greeks among the Jew, Greeks, the Jews among the Greeks, yeah. And also the Greeks. What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Holy Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given because Jesus had not been glorified. Okay? So streams of living water, by the way, that is an image like the bread of life. And by the way, streams of living water was part of this festival. All right? I don't know exactly. Because of the water that came from the rock in the wilderness, remember that? The people were crabbing, they didn't have any water. Sent us out to the desert to die of starvation and, and, and thirst. Okay? So <coughs> the living water, it's not dead water, it's always what? Flowing. flowing. It's always moving. All right? Everybody understand that? So the Holy Spirit is the living water in our life that is always flowing in your life. Correct? And the Spirit always seeks to improve you and me. And let me just say, he's doing a better job in some of us than others. <laughs> uh, we won't bother to point out who that might be. Yeah, we won't name names. All right, where are we? On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is, a pro is the prophet. Others said, he's, he's the Christ. Others said, how can the Christ come from Galilee? By the way, what's in Galilee? Nazareth, okay? 
Does not the scripture say that the Messiah must come from David's family, from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? The people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Okay? Finally, okay, remember the temple guards? So here they are after this time. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests. They were sent to arrest Jesus. And the Pharisees asked them, why didn't you bring him in? <laughs> they sent him to arrest him, and they didn't bring him in. And they say, can you see their mouths? No one ever spoke like he did. We were so amazed. We, could not, we couldn't bring ourselves to arrest him. They were enthralled, okay? The guards, the guards. And by the way, that takes us to, what does that take us to? Thank you. The crucifixion with the, with the uh, soldier under the cross. And the soldier says what? Surely this man was the son of God. Isn't that interesting? Part of the temple, God, temple guard. Now those boys were working for whom? The lead? No, the Pharisees. They were working for the Pharisees probably, yeah. Or maybe it, maybe it was a Roman. Yeah, I don't know. I'm getting my stories mixed up. All right, let's move on. Finally, the temple guards came back. Verse 47, you mean he's deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Has any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. Listen to the attitude of the Pharisees, okay? They knew everything, and they knew, at least in their own minds, they knew everything, and in their mind, Jesus was not the Messiah, all right? This mob that knows nothing. So there must be what? A curse on them. Finally, they thought Jesus was of the devil. Okay? Yeah. Now, Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Look into it. You will find that a prophet does not come from Galilee. Yeah, but isn't that interesting that Jesus came from Bethlehem and they were unaware of that? I, I never... Never put that together. All right. Uh, anything anybody wants to say on this section? This is a huge dialogue between the Pharisees and, and the followers of Jesus. And the one thing we learn is there's a lot of what? Confusion over who Jesus is. There's a lot of different opinions in varying groups in Jesus' ministry. Many of them are against him, and a few seem to be for him. And even his disciples. And his, yeah, even his brothers, yeah, have no clue. And even, I'll say, the disciples at this time have no clue. Because even when he raises from the dead, they say, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They were still thinking what? A worldly kingdom. Yeah. yeah. So there were very few, I don't want to say there weren't any, but there were very few seemingly who had a correct understanding of who Jesus was, at least at this juncture in his ministry. All right, let me... Um, let me see what I will find. Division among the authorities, teachers of the law. Uh, oh, you know why Galilee was so bad? Because Galilee was not godly enough to produce a prophet. But you know what prophet came from Galilee in the Old Testament? You know that. Oh, you read this. Okay, good. Jonah came from Galilee. I didn't know that. All right, anything else? Uh, the people are divided. That's, I think that's the main lesson we learn. The people are divided. Still true to this day, isn't it? Yeah. So Jesus is a good guy. 
And by the way, that is, that is the new progressive Christianity. Yeah. Jesus is what? Nothing nice about no, he's a nice man who shows us how to be nice. He gets us. He understands us. No. What is he not? He has no rules or limits for us to follow. That's correct. Or he, ge- or he gives us, he, he's a model to follow. He is a model. They'll say that, but no rules. Yeah, you can do what you want. He gets us. Well, then he's not a model yeah. to follow. Well, but they would, they would say that, though. I think they would say that. But anyway, what is he not? He's not savior. He's not no. He's not savior and lord. He's not Almighty God, who we are to bow down and worship and adore. And he's not going to judge. Yeah, yeah. He, there, he will not come to judge the living and the dead. So there's no judgment. You can do whatever you want. And what we used to be wrong, that's not wrong anymore. You know, it's always I mean, you go through the commandments. You know, you got honor your father and your mother. Remember the Sabbath day, the positive ones. But then you have committing adultery, starts with sexual issues, then stealing uh, property. But then we get two commandments on what? Coveting. Coveting, wanting. That's the, I personally, I think that is the foundation of our sin. We want what we want. And our sinful nature always wants what? to do what we want, what makes us happy, and there's no, there's nothing wrong with it. You can do whatever you want. So if, yeah, and so if there, if you don't do anything wrong, there's no sin, then you don't need a savior. And by the way, people, this is infiltrating the Christian church all around. Okay? I mean, I I know I talk about progressive Christianity, but we got people coming to church here Because they came from churches where there's no Jesus. Or Jesus is just, you know, a nice guy. Just now think about that. Got rid of confession. No confession anymore. We don't, and yeah, no, and that's why I said Sunday, I'm closer to the Roman Catholic Church now than I am to many of the Protestant churches. They still got the creeds. They still, and somebody said they still, they still use the Bible. They got a, they got a bunch of problems. You want to check the mailman's here? He's going to be okay. He can, okay. Okay. But you know, think about that. They still got that. I mean, I know they got a lot of issues, but that I disagree with. But still, Jesus is Savior and Lord. If you go to a Catholic church, who do you see on the cross? Jesus. Well, yeah. All right. Let's move on. This next section, uh, let me say this. This was never, uh, let me just read this. This was never part of the original form of the fourth gospel. All right, this next section. It uh, was omitted from the earliest copies of the Greek New Testament. And remember, they sat down and copied them by hand. No Greek commentator, in other words, no one who wrote commentaries, spoke any of this until 1,200 years later, 12th century, 1,100. And no Eastern fathers uh, spoke about it. It has different vocabulary. So what about this? Personally, I, th- I think it, pro- it doesn't mean it's not true. And I tend to believe it is true. It just didn't make it into John's first... It didn't make it in. Commentary says. Yeah. This verse shows that the story was originally attached yeah, another narrative, yeah. Okay. All right, so let's go on. What am I doing? Reading. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple where all the people gathered around him. He sat down to teach them, okay? The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses commanded us in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? Notice this comment. They're using this question as a trap to have a basis for accusing him. Okay. By the way, I think this was very common. They were looking for a way to get against the law. Notice against the law. 
So what does Jesus do? This is almost comical. He bent down, started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, you know, if any one of you is without sin, let that person be the first to throw a stone at him. And you see him looking at him? And then he goes back down on his knee and he starts, do, but now, no, he's doodling in the ground. In the dirt, yeah. All right? Can you see that? I, it's kind of comical in a way. All right? Because Jesus knows what's, what's up. He knows what's going on. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. Notice the older ones first. Notice that. Now that's in there. Only Until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. So he, you know, he's doodling, and they're starting to walk. Interesting, the older ones leave, and the young one says, well, I guess we should leave too. And Jesus straightened up finally, and he said, woman, where are they? Has no one here to condemn you? No one, sir. And now we're given this short response. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Okay. Yeah, very, very simple. Now, I have a few notes on this. Some people think uh, that this was an uh, actual event, and I tend to believe that too. They wanted to what? Discredit him. They wanted to find a way to get him in trouble to eventually kill him as an enemy of the law. All right? Was this a framed event? Was this a framed event? Did they set it up completely that it wasn't even true to catch him? I don't know. Could be. Yeah, it was. Well, no, re no, yeah, it, it, pro it was in some fashion. Um, yeah. Yeah, let's look at it from her perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't even know if she actually... Was an adulteress? Yeah. There's no indication. We don't have that indicated. It's not indicated. All right, let's move on. Where are we? We're going on to... Uh, Jesus' testimony. This is called scene number three. Uh, with Jesus still at the tabernacles, I think. Anyway, all right. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid, which makes sense, right? You've got to have someone to back you up. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. Well, no, they didn't. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right because I'm not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. Oh, this must have really irritated them. In your own, no, I don't know. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I'm one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. So they asked him, no, they're not. Where's your father? You do not know me or my father. If you knew me, now notice this. This is an important thing. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place. Yet no one seized him because his time, here you have it again, has not yet come. Now, so think about that. And this comes later on, too. I think that same phrase, you don't know me. If you do know me, if you, would, if you knew me, you would know my father. Now think about that. When Jesus speaks... For those of us who believe in him, we know the Father says the same, and he is speaking through the Son. OK? 
Okay? We accept that. An unbeliever would only see Jesus as a great prophet or a great man and wouldn't necessarily see that as God. And, this, and that maybe that isn't so much for us, but that certainly was true for the Pharisees. Correct? Because they didn't see Jesus as speaking for Almighty God, Yahweh. They, no, they didn't see him speak. And Jesus says, I think he says to them later on, if, if you knew me, you would know my Father. If you accepted my words, you, knew, you would know they come from him. But you don't know him. Which shows their faith was superficial. Did we talk about this last week? Where faith, faith becomes ceremonial? No, we did that in Bible class on Sunday morning. Yeah, that was, if I remember, where faith becomes ritualistic. Didn't we talk about that last week? Yeah, we did. You guys have a worse memory than I have. Well, maybe, <laughs> didn't we? That, that church, oh no, it was, I had a conversation with someone who was visiting us, yes. Yeah, and then I shared it with, and I shared it with the class on Wednesday, on, on Sunday. On Sunday. Oh, okay. Anyway, yeah, because I met with her after the class. All right, got my timing. Anyway, senior moment, yes. And the, the danger, the person said, I was in a church that everything was the ritualism was so important. And that's true in some churches where it, you're going through the motions and the ritualism is so important. And well, or there's, there's no gospel, let's say. Or the gospel is sort of secondary. We got to be careful about that too. You know, we got to be careful that you don't light the candles a certain way, otherwise it's wrong. Daryl Cropke, he does it all wrong all the time. But anyway, no, I had, that ha I, ha I had that happen. I had that happen here. I haven't had it here recently, but I had it happen here in, I in Iowa very much. They were, they were well, if you don't, the kids, you got to light it the right, sir, yeah, or however it is, I don't know. I've, I forgot now. Well, you but, can't light the candles unless you're wearing a robe. Yeah, well, whatever. So anyway, <laughs> but we got to be careful about that. No, and seriously, in the church, we've got to be careful about ritualism. And we do that, forgive me, and anybody want to see me online, you can call, call the church office and talk to the secretary. But anyway, <laughs> I, have had, I have had conversations with people from the Midwest who have said to me, Barth, you're not, you, you don't have Lutheran worship. Because you do different things. You have to follow the liturgy totally in the hymn book. No, you've never heard that. You have never heard any criticism? I have. What did you do? I said, okay. Did you agree with them? No, I said, okay. I didn't throw them off I, because worship to me is thematic for the day. And like we'll use the psalm like we did last week. We use the psalm, the responsively, because it fit the theme. And then you use the liturgy to fit the theme, okay? And, and the, there should be a variety. I don't know. If you disagree with me, that's okay. You can become the pastor and choose, and choose what you want, you know. I think that's I, He would not divert. He would not do. Totally. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Al. I don't know if that's true. I don't know. I, I don't know if that's true. I think for some it is that it should fit the theme of the day. And, and confession should be a part of it, you know. I mean, not every Sunday, but... I don't know, and it's it's, it's up that to me it's freedom of the gospel in worship. All right, it isn't the form that matters as much as the the content. The content. Yeah. Thank you, the, the content. Yeah. yeah. How'd you like to go to church? To me, the much worse thing is to go to church and hear no gospel. No. Just now, think about going to ch church and not 
using the Bible and not using Jesus' name and hearing the gospel. Wow. All right, where are we? What verse am I at? Anybody? Norlene says 19. Norlene has a good mind. Then they asked, yeah, then they asked him, where's your father? No, you do. You did not know, you do not know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put, yet no one sees them because his time, yeah, we read that. Once more, Jesus said to them, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will, and you will die in your sins. This is very harsh. Where you go, you can. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, "Will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go?" No, this this is what they were thinking. You cannot come. But he continued, "You are from below. You're coming from the worldly perspective. I'm from a, a divine. You are of this world. I'm not of this world. I told you that you would die." Die in your sins if you don't believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. Now that's a tough verse, but it's still true. If you don't accept the Lord, then you are going to die in your sins. Not in the forgiveness of sins, but in your sins. We don't like that. People don't want to hear that. Who are you, they asked. Just what I have been claiming all along. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. They didn't understand what he was telling them about his father. You see that? Total discommunication. So Jesus said, when you, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be. And that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. For I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. Yeah, see, we go back and forth. So there were those who put their faith. The part here that I want to go back to is the amazing thing in the book of Acts in the early chapters, is how many people in Jerusalem, I think I preached this on Good Friday, who yelled, crucify him, crucify him, in the next period of time through Pentecost, after Pentecost, many of them came to accept him as the Messiah, which is a huge, huge turnaround and miracle and change. Yeah. I mean, when you think about that, you're yelling, crucify him, and three months later, you're confessing he, him as my Lord and my Savior because of you know, the Holy Spirit. And, you know, well, eventually, yeah, after, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the Spirit is given and came through the preaching of the apostles, in, first of all, in Jerusalem. Who would have thought that the church, the Christian church in Jerusalem would have been as big as it was? And then they dispersed. Remember that in Acts chapter 6? They all had a what? Get out of town because the Jews were after them. The leadership. Huh? Yeah, they all, yeah, after James' death. That's right, in chapter 5. And then it spread. Okay. All right, so what do we learn from this? What do I want to say? Jesus is the one from the world above. And that's what I believe, that he is Almighty God sent from heaven above to be our Lord and our Savior. And the crazy thing is, he came what? Not to set up an earthly, worldly kingdom of power and judgment, but to set up the Holy Christian Church and the, and the, and the way of faith and truth and life. Isn't that nuts? Mm -hmm. And he came to die. That, that to me is always the bizarre thing. No human being would make this up 
in the New Testament. No human being would make that up. Because if God was going to come from a human perspective, God would what? He would take over. He'd be powerful. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? No. Because, and God comes to die to pay for the sins of the world. God sends his son to die because that was the divine plan to pay for the sin as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. And all who believe in him and accept him as their Savior and Lord have the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. By the way, this Sunday we're celebrating the Feast of All Saints. And again, the book of Revelation and all of that, you know, the unnumberable number of the 144,000, which is innumerable amount of those who believe and trust in Jesus. The other thing that's amazing to me is how the kingdom of God has grown around the world. Yes. And the center of Christendom is? Is Africa now. It moved into Europe and then to North America, and now it's in Africa. And in Asia, and, I, and in China, the church is booming underground. It's crazy. By the way, I saw something on the news, and I'm probably getting in trouble for this too, but they were interviewing a woman from China when, when liberation came. Remember that? That was years ago. The, the communists came in. They called it the liberation. And so the guy asked her, well, were you, did, were you liberated to use your Bible? No. Were you liberated to go to church? Oh, no. <laughs> were you liberated to, to worship? No. Isn't that crazy? They call it the liberation, but no liberation for the Christian, the Holy Christian Church. And the Christian... Yeah. And the Christian Church is huge underground in China. And if we were there, we would not be sitting here because we, would, we could be, who knows, we'd be hiding somewhere in someone's house. And now, now those, those people, dear folks, are what? They're committed. They're willing to suffer. You know, I have to go to, go to uh, Voice of the Martyrs. Oh, my gosh. And in, and in Africa, too, and other places. All right, so next week is session seven, which will be chap the rest of chapter eight into chapter nine. And uh, so seven, nine what? Eight thirty-one to nine forty-one. To nine forty-one. Oh, the end of the chapter. Yeah, then we go on to the Good Shepherd. And so Sunday we're celebrating. Um, all Saints Day, and I'm preaching on chapter 11, which is Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus. And you know how I tell you when we come to the miracles, there's always a setup, right? Remember that? Be, yeah, in the books, in the Gospels. There's always, it, the writers always set it up, this like four, five, six verses, and then comes the miracle. Like the feeding of the 5,000, there's the setup. Then comes the miracle. The raising of Lazarus, the setup is 37 verses long. And the actual event is only about seven verses long. So what's the point of, of the raising of Lazarus? It's much bigger than just, yeah, just that event. Yeah. All right, let's have a prayer. And... Um, Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came and spoke the will and the way of the Father. We thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit who gives us life and opens up our minds and hearts to believe and receive you as the one the Father sent. Dear Lord, today be with our brothers and sisters here and around the world especially those who are suffering because of their faith. But also, dear Lord, we pray for those who may be leaving the faith, 
to buy a watered-down version of religiosity where you, dear Jesus, are no longer Lord and Savior to be worshipped and adored, but just a good guy who kind of shows us how to, how to be. Dear Lord, help these people not to go that way of the devil, but to stay close to you and accept you as their Lord and Savior who gives eternal life. Thank you for this time together. Bless our brothers and sisters around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you all on uh, the evening news. <laughs> all right, goodbye, all those of you who may be watching.